So in this lecture video, Fields and Waves number five, uh, we're going to be introducing the way in which electric fields interact with materials. And the two types of materials we'll be talking about are called uh, conducting materials and dielectric materials. Although in practice, a material could have some of both, um, some conductivity and some dielectric nature to it. Uh, so we'll split this up into two parts. The first will be on dielectrics and then next we'll move on to conductors. So let's start off with dielectrics. All right, so let me uh, draw an analogy for you that's gonna help you understand um, what a dielectric is and uh, um, how the material is going to play into that. So um, let's imagine a ramp right here, right? That just slopes downwards. And going back to my, uh, you know, my, uh, um, analogy about using water. I think that this is another opportunity for me to do that. So um, let's say you've got a hose over here. And out of that hose, uh, you're, you're, you're basically uh, turning on uh, a flow of water that's coming out this hose. All right, now uh, this, this particular ramp though is a little bit unusual in that it's lined with sandpaper for part of it. And for other parts of it, it's smooth. So let's say this uh, portion right here is smooth. And this portion right here is some very rough surface, that, you know, maybe like sandpaper, right? Or a carpet, for example. All right, and this just alternates back and forth. This is smooth and this is rough. All right, now uh, the water that comes out from this, uh, this spout right here is certainly going to work its way down to the bottom. Gravity is eventually going to win. Uh, and so let's say I'm going to ask you two different questions. The first is uh, if I take different measurements in different locations and I ask you, number one, what is the flow rate of the water, right? Gallons per minute, for example. What is the flow rate of the water? Right? I might ask you that question. The second question that I might ask you is, if I stick a toothpaste or sorry, a toothpick inside the water, then what kind of force are we, are we going to be exerting on that toothpick or on your finger if you put your finger in the water? All right, so what is the force on a toothpick in the water? Right, that's stuck in the water. And so the toothpick might look like this, all right? So um, if I were to ask you these two questions, uh, perhaps your intuition would tell you that the answers are going to be a little bit different from each other. The flow rate of the water, for example, that ought, ought to be constant. There's, there's no reason to expect that um, you've got more water flowing here as you've got flowing there, as you've got flowing there, right? Because it's working its way down to the bottom. You can't create water out of nowhere. Um, and you can't make water vanish. So whatever water is starting, it's gotta be working its way downwards. Um, and so the flow rate of the water ought to be constant down this entire ramp. All right, question number two though, the answer is a little bit different, right? Because if, uh, if I stick a toothpaste, uh, sorry, a toothpick in there, um, uh, the total force on it is basically going to be sort of uh, set by the velocity of the water on one hand, and then there's friction uh, holding the toothpick in place on the other hand, and those are kind of balancing out. Um, and the friction is a little bit different, right? The, the friction is acting to slow down the downward motion of the water. Um, and uh, in, in doing so, it also may help hold the toothpick in place. And so the, the difference in friction uh, up and down this ramp could well change the force of a toothpick that's stuck in, in, uh, in, in the water. So how do we rectify these two things? The flow rate is the same, but the force from that flow of water is different. Uh, so we almost need two different quantities to, to do this. And um, the answer to what would actually happen is that the, the level of the water would change, right? It might uh, um, be a little bit higher on the rough surfaces and a little bit lower on the smooth surfaces. So that way in the rough surfaces, you have water that's moving slower, but it's a thicker um, layer of it. And so the flow rate is the same, but the force is less. Right, since each little gram of water is, is able to push less. Um, whereas the smoother surfaces, it might be flowing faster, um, but uh, um, it uh, um, is, a, is a thinner layer. So 
that sort of counteracts the, the, the faster speed, right? So the total flow of water remains the same. So that's how we can rectify this. Now, in the electromagnetic phenomenon, uh, there's a similar dynamic going on in terms of the material response, something very similar to friction that we're going to deal with. And so uh, we've already defined E, right? E is the electric field. And we've already stated in the last lecture that electric field had something to do with the force, right? It was a Newtons of force per coulombs, uh, although the true uh, units ended up being volts per meter, as it's more commonly stated. And so this is connected to the force. We need something else that's going to tell us something about the flow of these field lines that emerge, right? Since uh, for different materials, we're going to basically have different amounts of friction equivalent, right? Electromagnetic friction, if you like. And we're going to call that quantity D. D is going to be called electric flux. Right, flux is just a fancy way of saying flow, right? Electric flux. Um, the units of flux will be coulombs per meter squared. And it's gonna make a little bit of sense why it's coulombs per meter squared in a second, right? So we've got this relationship between E and D, um, or we have the, these two quantities that we're going to define. Uh, and this uh, D field is gonna be connected to the flow rate, right? Or the flow of field lines. All right, so let's uh, try to understand the way material responds um, to sort of create these uh, different quantities D and E. And let's imagine a material like here. And this material is made up of lots of different molecules and uh, molecules in general have some uh, ability to respond to electric fields. It's pretty easy to get what's called a, a dipole moment within the molecule, which is to say that the molecule can rotate a little bit and put a small amount of positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. So let's start out with the material that's embedded inside of an electric field like this, pointed in that direction. The electric field is going to drive positive charges in the direction of the arrow and negative charges will be driven in the opposite direction. So these molecules are gonna have a slight tendency to orient with positive, um, charges in one direction and negative charge in the other. Uh, and again, this is only a slight tendency. So if I look at a million molecules, I may get 50.1% oriented this way and 49.9% oriented the other way, but there's still a slight enough imbalance that there is a net pushing of positive charges to the right and negative charges to the left. All right, so I'll just draw one more here. All right, so this is the material responding to an electric field. All right, in doing so, uh, we're gonna define something called a polarization vector, and I'm gonna call it P, okay? Uh, what we've got here is basically a very slight separation of charge because we move positive charges to the left and negative charges, uh, sorry, uh, positive charges to the right and negative charges to the left. And that creates an electric polarization or separation of charge. So this vector P is going to define how much charge separation we've got. In order to separate charge, we need to take some amount of charge and we need to pull it apart. The more charge we pull apart, the bigger our electric polarization is. And the further apart we separate those charges, again, the higher the polarization will be. So the units of P are going to be in units of coulombs times meter, right? You have an amount of charge separated by a certain amount, but it's also evenly distributed through this material. And so we gotta divide this by a unit volume per meter cubed. So this just becomes coulombs per meter squared. Right? That's the unit of this uh, um, electric polarization. And so the connection between um, D and E, we can basically come up with um, on the assumption that, well, let me make this in black, that this flow rate D is equal to uh, epsilon naught times E plus this polarization vector. All right, so epsilon naught times E basically is um, a relationship between D and E that we would expect for uh, empty vacuum and there ought to be some constant that relates D and E. And then you get to add to that the effect of the polarization in the material, which we call P. 
right? So we don't, you know, we don't necessarily need to know what epsilon on is, but if we assume there's empty space, D and E have to have some relationship to each other. Uh, and so epsilon naught is simply the number that connects those two together, right? That scales them together. And P now accounts for the response of the material. All right, now in most materials, uh, we can make an approximation, which is what we're gonna call a simple material. We can make two assumptions. The first is that the polarization vector is parallel to the electric field. And the second is that the intensity of the polarization vector is proportional to the intensity of the electric field. So if I double the electric field, um, then I'm having more and more polarization. If I have the electric field, then I'm gonna have less polarization. So that's condition number two. All right, if we, uh, if we make these assumptions, then we can basically state that P equals some uh, multiplication factor times the electric field. All right, whatever that number is, um, this chi right here uh, is called the um, called the susceptibility, the electric susceptibility. And it tells us, roughly speaking, how much the material responds to an electric field. If chi is zero, the material does not respond at all. It ignores the presence of an electric field. If chi is big, then the material responds a lot. Take this and substitute it in here. And we get the following. We get that D equals epsilon naught plus chi epsilon naught times E, which we could, of course can be write as epsilon naught E times one plus chi, right? So this relationship between D and E is pretty cleanly defined in cases where we have the proportionality constant between electric field and charge separation in the material, right? Or, or the, the polarization of the molecules inside the material. And this um, factor here, one plus chi, we're gonna call that something special. We're gonna call it epsilon r, right? Or the relative permittivity. It tells us by how much the permittivity has scaled. Spell that. By how much the um, uh, permittivity has scaled compared to that of free space. All right, so uh, one plus this value chi equals epsilon r. All right, so uh, epsilon r or chi, if you will, basically measures how effective a material is at rearranging its charges and creating a secondary electric field that opposes the imposed electric field to begin with. All right, so this is a little bit like friction in the sense that if I have a very rough surface and I try to drag a car across it, right, I exert a force on the car and I'm dragging it, but friction is exerting a force in the opposite direction that's slowing me down. Uh, and so even though I'm putting a lot of force on this car, the actual flow of that car or the speed of that car is relatively small. Uh, and there's a similar effect happening here. We put a big electric field on the material, but the actual net electric field that appears in the material is reduced because of that polarization, right? This polarization is gonna to tend to create a secondary electric field that goes in the opposite direction, right? This is E secondary. It's an induced electric field, right? Electric fields are gonna go from positive to negative and we have pushed the positive charges to the right and the negatives to the left. So the secondary electric field will go the other way. Right, so this kind of makes sense with our sort of friction analogy where the material response is kind of like the friction that slows down uh, the ability of electric fields to, to take effect, right? Um, so epsilon r has no units because it's just a scaling factor. So the permittivity of material is simply equal to the relative permittivity times the value of free space. Or um, if you happen to know the electric susceptibility of material, 
then it's simply, it's simply one plus chi times the um, free space value of permittivity. So let's um, try to apply this to a simple scenario where we have two walls right here. And in the center, in between these two walls, uh, we have a very large uh, permittivity. Epsilon r is uh, positive and greater than one. And on either side of this, we've got relative permittivities of one, right? So there's free space on each of these two sides. Um, and there is some dielectric material that responds in the middle, right? Now let's say we start out by putting a constant electric field everywhere. All right, so I'm gonna draw four arrows here, right? Because the direction of the arrow tells us where the electric field is pointing and the density of the arrows uh, tells us something about the um, uh, intensity of the electric field. All right, so I'm gonna start out by doing this. This material, however, is going to create a polarization vector. All right, so here's the P vector, or as these vectors are all E. And this polarization vector is going to create a secondary electric field that points in the other direction. So this is E secondary. And so the actual electric field uh, is basically going to be reduced. So I'm gonna just remove two of these to demonstrate that the actual electric field is basically half of what it was um, as a result in this uh, pictorial example. All right, so this is the this is the new electric field after adjusting for that cancellation in the secondary electric field. Now, fundamentally, this is happening because molecules are rearranging like this, with positives on this side and negatives on the other. Right, that's the that's where this electric polarization comes, or the separation of charges. Uh, but what that means is if you look right along the edge of the material, right, you look right along here at the edge of this material, you'll see some excess charge, right? There's a little more uh, positive than there is negative on this side here, right? So um, from a certain perspective, we could sort of say that there are some extra positive charges built up right here. And there are some extra negative charges built up right there because that last sort of line of molecules has pointed all its uh, negatives to the left and there's no you know, next layer over to cancel it out with positives. And these positives and negatives are then going to create that secondary electric field that we talked about, right? So you can look at it uh, either as polarization or you can look at it as uh, extra charges on the left and the right that create the secondary electric field that thereby reduce the total electric field. All right, now what is this charge right here? Right. Is this a real charge? The answer is no. This is what we would call bound charge or polarization charge. So it is not a charge that's mobile. It's not a charge that can create current. Uh, it doesn't contribute to um, currents or uh, uh, electric conductivity, um, but it is sort of a charge that's sort of built up in one place. And so from, from the perspective of electric field, we basically have to take this into account, right? This is a real thing. You have positive and negative charges and an electric field will build up between them. But from the perspective of, of um, the D field, it's gonna look a little bit different because from the perspective of the D field, we're only going to include the effects of uh, free charges and this is not a free charge. So from the perspective of the D field, we're gonna have some electric flux density over here. And it's going to be the same everywhere, right? The D field effectively tells us something not about how the material responds, but about what is the flow of electric field or, or of electric uh, stuff, electric lines through this material. Probably there's, you know, maybe some kind of source over here that created these lines to begin with. And just like water, the water has to get through right here. The boundaries of the material cannot stop the flow of water that has to be constant. Because again, water cannot vanish or disappear. There are no sources and sinks to create extra field lines. Uh, and so these D lines simply have to continue through the material.
And so a D-field is a way basically to remove the material properties and only ask the question is uh, of uh, where are the field lines coming from, right? And so given that we know that uh, field lines emerge from sources, and we're gonna see more about this later, right? Field lines emerge from sources. The D field is intrinsically connected to sources or charges, right? Whereas the E field was about forces, the D field is about sources, gotta like the rhyme. Uh, and so it should now make a little bit of sense why the units of D field of the electric flux density are coulombs per meter squared, right? Because this has to do with sources or where are the charges? It's not about the force, right? So um, that's basically why D has this unit, whereas the electric field units are newtons per coulomb or volts per meter, right? And that is connected to the force. So two perspectives of the exact same problem where I have a boundary of materials and I impose an electric field on top of it. Um, the D and the E field simply give us two sides of the same coin, uh, just like that water flowing down the ramp, whether we're talking about forces or whether we're talking about the flow of, um, of charges. All right, so that, uh, that'll conclude uh, this part one here on dielectrics. In part two, we're gonna talk about conductors, which are materials that do have excess free and mobile charges and how they respond as well.